Matthew chapter 21, 18 to 27. If you've missed out on any in our series, they're all online and uh, I'm very thankful for the tech people who put them up each Sunday afternoon. Verse 18. Early in the morning as he was returning to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he went up to it and found nothing on it except leaves. And he said to it, May no fruit ever come from you again. At once the fig tree withered. When the disciples saw it, they were amazed and said, How did the fig tree wither so quickly? Jesus answered them, I assure you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you'll not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if, I t- but even if you tell this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea, it will be done. And if you believe, you'll receive whatever you ask for in prayer. When he entered the temple complex, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them, I'll also ask you one question, and if you answer it for me, then I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. Where did John's baptism come from? From heaven or from men? They began to argue among themselves. If we say from heaven, he'll say to us, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, we're afraid of the crowd because everyone thought John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. He said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. This is the word of the Lord. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Thanks for its goodness. Uh, Thanks for its relevance. Thanks for its clarity. Father, forgive us for when we don't listen to your word, soften our hearts and minds by your spirit. And please apply this word to our lives. Amen. Early in the morning as he was returning to the city, he was hungry. Jesus is hungry. He spent the night in Bethany, a short walk from Jerusalem, about two miles. They're heading back into Jerusalem up the hill and Jesus is hungry. He's a human just like you and me. His tummy grumbles. Small details like that word, hunger, and we're reminded of Jesus' identity, aren't we? And we saw it only the day before as Jesus entered Jerusalem. Jesus needed a donkey. Only humans have needs. Gods don't have needs. Only humans have needs. Needs like sleep and hunger and rest and transport and tools. And the identity of Jesus is really important in this last week of his life. It's on every page. He's the king, God on a donkey, who enters his capital and shakes it up. He goes to my house and he cleans it, revealing his desire for anyone to dwell with him. He gets the broken and fixes them. He welcomes the sinner and forgives them. He brings the outsider into his own dinner table when they depend on him. He confronts the insider who says they're independent of him. He's the mouthpiece of God, the son of David, to whom people are already praying for salvation as they come into the city. His identity, his authority and his power. Part of every moment in this last week, early in the morning as he was returning to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he went up to it and found found nothing on it except leaves. He said to it, may no fruit ever come from you again. And at once the fig tree withered. Jesus is hungry. He sees a fig tree. The leaves suggest fruit. He goes up to it. It's got no fruit. He curses it. Immediately he withers. It withers, and what it is will be what it will be forever. Fruitless. Strange little episode, isn't it? (laughs) Strange little episode. Let, Let me suggest what it can't mean. Let's get that out of the way first. Firstly, Jesus has not had a sugar low tantrum, okay? Let's just get that out of the way. Jesus is not chucking a tanty by the side of the road. We already learnt three weeks ago that the owner of the vineyard always does what's right. So whatever Jesus is doing here, it's righteous. Jesus is not using his authority in a vindictive or nasty way like the Roman and Greek gods did. Wake up on the wrong side of bed, no one got my porridge ready, I'm just going to start cursing. Jesus doesn't work that way. It can't mean that. So what can it mean? The context, both the immediate context and the context of God's word, 
help us understand that this is a miracle of judgment, a miracle of judgment that shows who Jesus is, that shows his magnificence. Just a day before, he's come into Jerusalem, he's shaken the city, he's entered his house, my temple. He's seen everyone gathered there doing all the right religious things, exchanging money, getting animals organised, all the insiders in one place, ticking all the religious boxes. A lot of leaves, not much fruit. A lot of leaves, not much fruit. There is an abundance of independence from God in his plans. There is a complete lack of outsiders being allowed in. There's a perversion and abuse of the house of God. A lot of leaves, but not much fruit. And that shouldn't surprise us if we listen closely to what Steve read from Jeremiah. Because in Jeremiah, God said he would judge the insiders. And if you notice in that last verse, he would then condemn them in their fruitless life to an eternity of being fruitless. The fig tree will have no fruit. So we've got a miracle of judgment, don't we? A miracle of judgment where the hungry bloke shows he has the authority to wither creation. He's fully man and he does what God says he will do in Jeremiah. He's fully God. It's a miracle of judgment where the identity of Jesus, his full humanity and his full divinity are displayed. But there are a couple of nuances here that sharpen it for us. The first one is, who's the audience for this miracle of judgment? Is it the religious leaders in the temple? No. Is it the people in the city? No, they they didn't see this. It's only the twelve. They're the ones who see this miracle. It's for the benefit of the outsiders who've been brought in. And they see it and they're amazed. We'll come back to that in a moment. Notice too that Matthew has done what he's done a number of times in this last week already. He suddenly moves us into the present tense. Jesus curses the fig tree today, (laughs) whenever you read it. There are these searing moments where Matthew suddenly switches the tense of the passage, stops talking about what has happened and says, this is happening when? Now. That verb there of Jesus saying in verse 19, he says. There's always he says for however long people read Matthew's gospel. He says. Who's he speaking to at the moment then? That might be us. Jesus is fully God and fully man and he performs a miracle of judgment about the fruitlessness of his people. It's been displayed already, hasn't it? Just go back to the previous day. It's been displayed as Jesus rides into his capital on his royal steed and people go, who's this bloke? (laughs) They ignore him. Uh, It's been displayed, this fruitlessness, as people have held on to their own independence in the face of his magnificence. It's been displayed already as people go, actually, we're going to use God's house this way and keep those people out. It's been displayed when the king is ignored and other structures are upheld. It's been displayed when the insider says, I'm going to do these things so I whitewash the rest of my life when I reject dependence upon God. And what does Jesus do? Fully God, fully man. He judges such fruitlessness amongst the insiders. It's not a surprising judgment. If you know Jeremiah, it's coming. It's a judgment you'd expect of a king with authority to do his will in his kingdom. And such judgment applies equally to the insiders today. That's people like us, the outsiders who've been brought in. I wonder about the leaves we display. And I wonder about the fruit on the tree. 
He's speaking in the present tense. Well, the disciples are struck by this. I'm at point three on the outline. I notice their response in verse 20 when the disciples saw it. They were amazed and said, how did this fig tree wither so quickly? Not even round up. They're wondering what authority and power is working here. And Jesus takes the opportunity to encourage them. Verse 21, Jesus answered them, I assure you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you'll not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you tell this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea, it'll be done. And if you believe, you'll receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Again, striking words, aren't they? We're familiar with these words. Jesus has actually spoken quite similarly a little earlier on. Thanks to Dan for pointing that out to me. Too often these words have been used out of context. So it's worthwhile stating what they don't mean. How many mountains has Jesus moved? None. He puts them. How many mountains have God's people moved across the centuries? None. So I I don't think it's actually saying you'll be able to move Capita. Jesus is also not saying, I think, that if you pray, you'll get it. If you pray, you'll get it. So it's worthwhile digging down into what he does say, uh, what he does mean by the very particular words he uses. I think he is being a man of encouragement and reassurance at this point. Again, remember the audience. Who's listening? It's the 12. No one else. It's important to notice that Jesus' comments focus on faith. Do you see that in both of those verses, believe and faith? Same word. And the nature and the object of the faith is clear. Faith in and of itself is dependence, isn't it? That's why it's faith. You're trusting in someone or something. You depend on them. And in the context, that dependence is on whom? It's on the king who's just come into his city on Jesus, who is both fully God and fully man. It's not blind faith, they can see him. It's not generic faith, it actually has a point and an object in connection to him. He's the king, God on a donkey. So in this sense, Jesus is talking to those who depend upon him as the king. And notice too that the faith is connected with evidence. It's dependence that doesn't doubt. After all, what have they just seen? A fig tree with it immediately. Is that a bloke you'd want to depend on? Yeah, probably. Against the backdrop of the last three years where he's done what? So it's not blind faith. It's faith connected with the evidence of the proclamation and practice of Jesus. Fully God, fully man. It's important to remember that Jesus has consistently taught from the very first time he preached in public that being connected with his kingdom, depending on him, will change you. Remember his first sermon? Repent and believe for the kingdom of heaven is near. That's about being changed. If you depend on Jesus, you will be turned around and you will be having another desire and another focus. And then you get to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 through 7, and you see it right the way through, don't you? So if you depend on Jesus, this one who withers fig trees, your desires will be turned around and fully focused on his. As such dependence is expressed in prayer, isn't it? Jesus has consistently taught that. Remember when the disciples are hearing about prayer in Matthew 6, our Father in heaven, your kingdom come, your... Notice how they've repented in that line? And they depend on their Father who already knows what they need. It's important to recognise that such wholehearted dependence... Such all-encompassing dependence on the one who withers fig trees in judgment will bear fruit. If Jesus has just judged fruitlessness, now he's enabling fruitfulness. How are you fruitful? Depend on the king, the one who does everything, the one who has just ridden into his capital in order to deal with the outsiders. And when you do that, what will happen to the world around you? It will be changed. It will be fundamentally reshaped. I I think that's what Jesus is teaching here. 
He has just judged fruitlessness and now he's enabling fruitfulness. How? Depend on Jesus. And if you depend on Jesus, that very same authority that judges fig trees will enable you to be fruitful. Do we hear that? Do we actually realize that if we wholeheartedly depend on Jesus, that same authority will work through us? That same authority, which we'll see in seven or eight days, opens the tomb. That same authority will work through us to change the world. Do do we actually believe that? And yet Jesus goes into his house and his authority is still questioned, isn't it? I'm at point four on the outline. Look at verse 23. When he entered the temple complex, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching. He said, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? It's actually the same question the disciples just asked, isn't it? What authority withered the fig tree? Jesus, what authority do you have? Uh, Where did you get it? What right do you have to speak like this in this place? Jesus does something that every parent wants to do constantly, come up with a clever question in response. But it's actually just a rabbinic method, the way the religious teachers. You ask me this question, let me ask you one in return. So Jesus does. Look at verse 24. Jesus answered them, I'll also ask you one question. If you answer it for me, then I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. Where did John's baptism come from, from heaven or from men? A very simple question. John's ministry, where was it from? Uh, On the one hand, Jesus asks a question which exposes the historical behaviour of the insiders. (laughs) How did they treat John? Uh, On the other hand, Jesus is saying, John and me, we're on the same team. We come from the same authority. We work with the same power. Uh, If you remember John's ministry, he came proclaiming a Repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Turn around from your independence and depend on the one God is sending. And Jesus himself did the same. His first sermon was exactly the same as what John was preaching, except Jesus now enabled it. He is the king that we depend on. John and Jesus are on the same team with the same authority, the same message, the same kingdom, the same desire to bring the outsider in. The religious leaders, the Poles aren't going to help us here, are they? I'm willing to give up their independence. I'm willing to face the crowd. I'm willing to acknowledge the legitimate authority of God's king. We don't know. And so Jesus says, I'm not going to speak to you guys. It's almost like the judgment on the fig tree, isn't it? I'm not going to entrust myself to you. He's just revealed himself in plain sight, hasn't he? And they won't recognise him. It's a pointed moment to finish this section on, somewhere there on that second day of this final week. By what authority does Jesus do these things? Last week we were reminded of his magnificence. He really is magnificent. Uh, we, we, we don't use that term appropriately, do we? Jesus is awe-inspiring. God on a donkey, shaking a city, cleaning his house, bringing the outsider in, binding up the broken, cleansing the insiders, the authority to welcome and remove and heal all born humbly. Same authority this week to judge unfruitfulness to enable fruitfulness. And then the passage closes with, do we recognise that authority? It's a searching question because it confronts us as the outsiders who are now the insiders. (laughs) It asks us whether we have a lot of leaves and not much fruit. It asks us what we depend on. It questions whether we are willfully ignoring the desires of the kingdom we say we are citizens in. It confronts our questioning of his authority when Jesus says something, and I say, Jesus, that is just too hard. 
What right do you have to tell me to do that? By what authority do you tell me this, Jesus? It confronts all those things, doesn't it? (laughs) This magnificent king. But then do you notice that it also enables and encourages the insiders? That authority is on public display and depending completely, without doubt, wholeheartedly upon him and his magnificent power. What, what will that do to the world? It will reshape it, won't it? It will completely change the world. It will enable us to be fruitful and it will point to the one who is fully God and fully man, who is magnificent, God on a donkey. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. That's a strange little episode. Uh, It's an episode that we often struggle with, don't quite know what to do with, sometimes use out of context. But, Father, thanks for your clarity here. Uh, Thank you for Jesus who has the authority to judge, uh, wither, who has the authority to enable and encourage and then pose us the question, uh, do you recognise this authority? Father, help us to do that and to be fruitful. Amen.